Well, okay. <laughs> Good morning, and thank you for joining us today. Um, I'd like to introduce Josh uh, McLeod, who's who's doing the uh, presentation today. Uh, Josh is with the National Federation of Independent Businesses, which is a member-driven, nonprofit, nonpartisan uh, organization advocating for small and independent businesses uh, nationwide. So we felt it was very important to hear what he has to say, what's going on over there. Um, Josh is the director of the Federal Government Relations at NFIB and the nation's leading small business advocacy organization. In his role, Josh oversees the organization's regulatory portfolio. And Josh came to NFIB after spending nearly 12 years in the US Senate working for Senator Ron Johnson. Josh graduated from Widener University in Pennsylvania and lives in Virginia with his wife and three children. So today he's going to be talking about breaking through the noise, how Congress can provide tax certainty and reduce red tape for small business. So Josh, um, thank you so much for coming today. I know you're a busy man uh, doing all the good work on Capitol Hill <laughs> that we don't want to do. So uh, we appreciate um, NFIB and you for, for attending today. I'll turn it over to you. Awesome. Thank you so much. and appreciate you having me and, and for listening to, uh, hopefully I'm not a blowhard. Hopefully I'm, I'm providing some value here, but I think, you know, I thought the title was fitting, right? There's a lot of noise in Washington. There is, I, I don't watch cable news, uh, because of that. Cause it's just atrocious, but, um, the reality is not as is very dysfunctional, right? And so I worked in the Senate. That was a very dysfunctional place. It continued the House and Senate continue to be dysfunctional. Um, but there's opportunities, right? And so we always have to be cognizant of the environment we live in. But where do we have chances for um to to get wins, to get small business W's on the board? Um, so I think that's where we try to live. Um, and our issue areas are tough, right? Taxes, uh, they're they're unfortunately a little more partisan issue these days than than uh, I would want them to be. Regulatory work is just a disaster. Um, we can't have a grown up conversation at all on on regulatory burdens, and it's incredibly frustrating uh, because the pace of regulatory regulatory overreach right now is unprecedented. So, I think. Um, you know, one, I'm I'm optimistic that in the long term, we can have a conversation about small business taxes. Um, we will have that conversation, probably not this Congress, but in the next upcoming Congress where uh, you have the expiration of a lot of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act provisions. And the one that NFIB that we care the most about is the small business deduction. That's the 20% deduction for pass-through businesses. And so that's where we put our legislative focus. That is our number one goal is to making sure that small businesses, the nine out of 10 business, eight out of 10, nine out of 10, depending on who you're listening to, um, of businesses have that tax certainty going into the future. So um, Main Street Tax Certainty Act is, is the bill that we've rallied behind. That is uh, in the Senate, a Senator Dane's bill in the House, it's uh, Congressman Lloyd Smucker bill. Um, we're working hard right now to get our co-sponsors up on that thing. We've done a really good job. This is the House version of the bill right here, H.R. 4721. Um, we're at 167 co-sponsors, which is incredible. Um, last Congress, there were 99. So we've really put in a lot of a lot of good work here to up our co-sponsor rate. And the importance of that is, is that that's a guaranteed vote in support of legislation. Now there will be turnover, you know, depending on on how things go with elections and then retirements. So we'll we'll have to start from scratch with uh with some of these members, but it's a good signal that a lot of folks they they see the value of the small business deduction 199A. Um, and so our goal is that we can get this number over 200, get it over 250. Um, but that's going to take getting a more bipartisan conversation here. And that's tough uh, because, 
this is a provision that was included in the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act on Capitol Hill. It's viewed a little more as a partisan uh, tax cut bill. Um, but we do have uh, Congressman Cuellar from Texas. He's, uh, he's the lead Democrat on the bill. We've got Congressman Josh Gottheimer from New Jersey that is also uh, a co-sponsor of the legislation. So we're working hard, long story short, uh, would, would love any feedback as we go along in this conversation here with if you've engaged with your congressional delegation, your senators, your House of Representative members, just to hear on a, where, where they are, because we can take that feedback on Capitol Hill and schedule meetings and do different things at the grassroots level that we can hopefully amplify uh, small business stories and get members of Congress in, in support. So that's what's going on in the House. Um, again, not we're not optimistic for this Congress that there will be uh, too many grand deals where something like this would, would uh, get done. But in grand fashion, as Congress likes to do, they'll probably wait till the last minute. Uh, so probably like December 2025 to do something about these expiring provisions that we know that we know need to be dealt with now. But um, Congress has a different operating window than than real than reality. We'll put it that way. Um, so we can go to the next slide and that'll show us the this is the Senate bill S 1706. This is a Steve Daines bill from he's from Montana. Uh, 31 co-sponsors on this one. Previous Congress, there were 14. So again, we're really amping up our uh, our support in the Senate as well as the House. So, you know, we're we're going in meetings every day, um, trying to get folks on board with this thing. And again, if I would love to hear from you all about your interactions and ways that you all think that that we can better engage with members of Congress, because I've the, my old boss was a plastics manufacturer, Senator Johnson. I uh, did that for 31 years. And, and so he he understood the, the power of an anecdote and that the business story is is basically what what moved him on issues. So um, I'm, that's where my mind comes from. Some members of Congress don't view that things that way. So we would love to. Uh, hear from you all about your interactions with your your delegation and and see what works and what doesn't work and swap stories and all that good stuff so we can go to the next slide so this is this is when we go into offices we're saying this is this is what why we need to do something here there there are massive implications if congress does not enact these tax uh enact some tax certainty here for for the small pass-through businesses 30 million small business owners will see a tax hike that's a huge number and it that's the goal right now is we have to draw attention to this issue and up the profile of it on capitol hill to break through the noise right because there is so much so many other things going on that take up is suck up the oxygen in the room so this is a this is a the type of number that will do that. Um, it's a big it's a big number. It resonates with people, and uh, hopefully that creates a sense of urgency on Capitol Hill that uh, is sorely needed on issues like this. Josh, do we know how many people those thirty million businesses employ? And. That that's an incredible question. I I have not seen yeah. anything like that, but that would be a really a really good thing to have. Because that that's kind of the point, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. For sure. And that's that's the type of thing that we try to tell congressional staff because as you see on this slide, most staff are pretty young. You all I'm sure you all have experience with um fly-ins and, and different things on capitol hill staff are young they don't have real world experience so they're they're going to be very new to these issues especially because they weren't here in 2017 when these tax cuts were signed into law so and we also find the same thing and with members of congress right about 50 percent turnover since 2017 
Um, and, and so we're dealing with a whole lot of education for congressional staff, but also the members of Congress that are like, what do you mean? What is, what is a pass-through business? What is a, what is a small, the small business deduction? So um, that's, that's the, the challenge right now is that we spend a whole lot of time educating when we want to be doing a little bit further down the line of, of our advocacy and, and outreach, but you know, that's, that's okay. And, 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 and like I said, we're going to have to do a whole lot more of that education because there's gonna be a lot more turnover uh, over the coming year plus. So that is uh that's reality on Capitol Hill right there. But I'm going to, I'm going to think through that employee number because I think you're right. That would be, an, another powerful anecdote to provide staff to really show the impact. And that's the thing that when we, when we talk to some offices, they're like, well, this is just a, this is just a benefit to the wealthy. It's really not right. The, our average member is going to be, you know, five, 10, 15 employees. They're small businesses. Um, so they're, they're the type of businesses that they're not putting this in, in their wallet or under their mattress. They are reinvesting in their business. They are, uh, they're hiring new employees. They're doing capital expenditures. I don't need to tell you guys all this, but uh, to those folks on, on the staffers on the Hill, it's, it need that point needs to be reinforced early and often, uh, unfortunately. So any, any questions on main street tax certainty act? It's um it's our big baby. And so we, we care a lot about it. We put a lot of time and effort into it and our members, uh, the, the majority of them are, are passed through. So they, they are, they are very driven on that issue. So happy to open it up for uh, any questions that you all have. Otherwise we can move on to this other really great issue. All right, here in none. So we'll we'll move on to FinCEN. So these, this is uh, another issue that no one's heard about. Um, members of Congress, staff, businesses, uh, trade associations. No one, no one has any idea about this. But these are brand new requirements that just went into effect on January first of this year. Um, it's it's very it's a very challenging it's a very weedsy issue, uh, but this these new requirements stem from what is called the Corporate Transparency Act. This was a bill that was around for I want to say a decade, um, and it finally was inserted into the NDAA, which is the Defense Authorization Bill, in 2021, as a is completely non germane, non related to defense amendments. Um, and, and so now, because this was shoved into the NDAA and we opposed it, unfortunately, Congress did not heed our warnings. Uh, now, uh, small businesses under 20 employees or 5 million in sales are required to report ownership stakes to FinCEN, which is a sub-agency of the Treasury Department. Um, very burdensome new reporting regime. FinCEN estimates that this year it will affect 32.6 million small businesses. Every year after, so every year to come, they estimate it will affect five to six million small businesses. Uh, so grant massive, massive new reporting regime, huge reach, uh, expanded reach of the federal government into small businesses. You can go to the next slide. This is this is uh, not, not hyperbole. This is the one of the most expansive small business regulations in history. Um, and and it, the crazy part is, is like I said, nobody knows about it. And no one's talking about it, but uh, Congress always talks good game. You know, we want to reduce red tape for small businesses. Well, here's an example where they have actively increased it and have no idea of what they've done, which is the craziest part about it. 
Um, we can go to the next slide. <clears throat> here we get here we have some of the uh, requirements. Uh, so businesses under twenty employees or less than five million in in revenue. Um, so again, the smallest of the small. Those are the businesses that are affected by this this new requirement, this new law. Um, and I think I think the as as we can get into further, the crazy part is is that there Congress wrote this statute so broad um, that it allowed FinCEN to interpret it however they want to. And, and as we'll talk about further, they've expanded the definition of who is affected to a larger number. And so um, as we see with, with regulatory regimes, they're, they're always trying to reach out their tentacles. And FinCEN has done that uh, with, with beneficial ownership. So we can go to the next slide. Here is, here's what I was talking about. Um, beneficial ownership, these, these vague terms, substantial, uh, control. FinCEN has brought in the scope of what that could mean. Um, substantial control is now, uh, you know, I'm not a lawyer, but I've, I've, I, you can read this to say that a GM of a restaurant has substantial control of the everyday decisions of the restaurant. So, should that individual report their to FinCEN? Probably, they're not an owner of the company. Uh, they don't have an ownership stake, but they they exert substantial control. So. It's a it's a gray area that I think it could in turn affect more than 32.6 million small businesses. That's that's kind of my read on where we could be going. So it it uh it 32.6 is a lot, million is a lot, but it could be much larger by the time all is said and done. So I think uh you know this. This could be an area we've heard from a few members of Congress about tightening up some of these uh, these vague language issues here. So that could be something that that Congress will revisit. But man, you talk about uh, about an example where Congress writes a very bad, uh, not bad, but just very vague statute, and the agency takes takes it and runs with it. Beneficial ownership is a really, really good example of of why Congress should be prescriptive when they write laws. Um, otherwise, the agency will take liberties as they as they can. Josh, what is what is FinCEN looking for? So the intent of the Corporate Transparency Act. Sorry, I should have started with, with this earlier. Uh, okay. It's it's to get at money laundering, and so um, you know. Everyone wants to get rid of shell companies. Sounds good. Uh, my fear, though, is that you're not going to have bad actors report to FinCEN. Um, so you're not getting at the root cause of, of what the law was intended to get at. All you're doing is sweeping in tens of millions of law-abiding small businesses into this new reporting regime that's, to be blunt, probably not going to probably not going to do much to solve the uh, intended intended effect or the intended problem. So I, uh, I, I think, again, a well-intentioned law passed by Congress, but at the end of the day, probably not going to be uh, successful and just will create more red tape compliance burdens on the smallest of the small businesses is kind of how I would summarize it. So, so Josh, is is from a practical standpoint of view, is it um, can we assume that CPAs will do that for their customers? Do they know about, know about it? it? CPAs are are familiar. Um, I've heard. I haven't spoke with anyone, but I've heard that CPAs have been giving marching orders by you know kind of their trade associations to not touch this. Wow. Uh, so I, I think they don't want to be uh, involved with the potential liability, how that could play out. Um, 
I think there's just a lot of uncertainty right now. And so a lot of, a lot of professions are like, we're just not going to touch it. And if CPAs aren't going to help, then I guess you got to go hire a uh, legal counsel to, to help with this sort of thing. Um, but I, I think, I think CPAs will, are, are going to be very aware of this and hopefully be helpful in navigating. Um, but hopefully, people, form, hopefully people have good CPA. <laughs> do we, do we know what information in particular they're looking for? What additional information? Yeah, they, they, they collect like your driver's license. Um, so that, so this is where we get into a lot of, a lot of issues. So the penalties for non-compliance are up to 10 years in uh, 10, sorry, let me start. The, the penalties for non-compliance are up to $10,000 civil fine or up to two years in prison. So, I mean, we're, we're looking at a pretty huge, uh, huge penalty regime here for uh, a lot of businesses that just don't know about what these requirements are. But one of the things that that you'll notice is if you're supposed to submit your driver's license, right? If if you happen to move uh, and don't submit an updated driver's license with your new address on it, you're in non-compliance. So um, they give you, I think, a 30 day window to submit your updated information but if you don't get ready for get ready for those penalties to come down on you so um i think it's it's a lot of your personal identifiable information which gets into some privacy concerns who has access to this database and uh what what's going to happen when there we know there will be potential leaks here so how, how do we safeguard 32.6 million small business owners information adequately. Josh, is this an offshoot of customer due diligence, the CDD that the banks have been doing for the last five years or so? So it's, they're supposed to harmonize uh, what the banks do here. So that should be a rule that they're, they're coming up with. Um, I think the banks are trying to offload a lot of their responsibilities onto someone like FinCEN. Um, but, that's kind of in the to be determined space of how that looks, how that harmonization looks. And it's not including as sole proprietors, correct? Sorry, say that again. Sole proprietors are not included in this. Yeah, they are. Sole proprietors too? Yeah. How about nonprofit? Uh yes, nonprofit is included, yes. Yeah, that's that's we I agree. Agree. We we have to report it when when we do business with nonprofits. We have to include this information too. So I'm assuming that that funnels to that as well. So so technically, how are they supposed to do this? If if I was to if I want to give my customers a heads up, yeah, listen, you need to do this. How do they do this? Is there a form they need to fill? Yeah, there's, there's, a, there's a there's a form on the FinCEN website um, where you can find everything that you need to well they claim they claim they're doing all kinds of outreach to the business community but i haven't seen it um and, and judging by our our surveys that we put out there to our members they're not seeing it either so um i i think there's just a whole a complete a complete uh chasm here between the world that government bureaucrats are living in and and the business community so it's a it's a it's a crazy issue and one in a different time and a place would generate a lot of of interest on Capitol Hill but it's just not it's just not a uh, for whatever reason for I don't know I don't know how what what piques the interest of members of Congress these days it's a it's a <laughs> interesting paradigm but this this used to be an issue that I think would the, either the privacy concerns or the, the small business burdens, this this would have gotten them real riled up, but only a few today. So does this um, include like 1099 information, uh, 1099 reports, 
uh, people that you've subcontracted, anything like that? Well, I mean, if you, I, I don't believe so. Uh, but again, I'm not a lawyer, so <laughs> I haven't, uh, yeah. I haven't studied this that closely, but I think the subcontractor would, would defense in. Yeah. Separately. I, I just, I'm amazed that they would pick this target, this small business target for this, but well, I I think they're, and I wasn't in the room when these negotiations were happening, but I think they were saying, well, these this is a a an area where there's there's no no focus from federal agencies on on money laundering and shell companies, and so um, I I think, and in, in that time and place, you know, everyone, all you got to do is throw out well Russia, right, or something like that, and you can get you can get national security concerns raised uh, pretty easily, and then and then that that outweighs all the the small business concerns for some reason. Um, so I think any however we shift the narrative back onto the burdens that have been imposed on small businesses is is kind of how I I at least I envision this trying to trying to steer the ship and. Uh, get outside of that national security uh, mess because it's, you can, you can hide anything under the veil of national security. And, you know, it, it's, that's at least my experience. I worked on the Senate Homeland Security and Government Affairs Committee. And it seems from my experience, anytime anyone wanted to do something, they would just say, well, national security. And it kind of, uh, it takes all other interests away. So, the impact on small business has got to be the focus of this conversation, in my opinion. True. Amazing. All right, let's go to the next slide. Okay, so here we just have some of the compliance burdens um, that FinCEN is estimating from this rule. Again, this is huge. Seventy-three billion in compliance costs. Um, in another day and age, this would have been a, a large uh, concern, and it it resonates with some people. But um, it, these, we just throw around massive numbers in Washington, and it doesn't uh, doesn't really get too much attention these days. But it's it's still a big number. It's a big compliance burden, and um, you know, we'll continue to beat the drum on it, but we can go to the next slide. So here we have some of the, the penalties that are associated with non-compliance. You know, we'll we'll see how how this goes. Um my my interest is going to be there's a lot of members of Congress that are small business owners and what if one of them doesn't know about this? And what if they're in non-compliance? Are they and and how how does this play out when when kind of the rubber hits the road uh, for some of some of these more uh, more out there uh, in the public businesses and uh, stories? So we'll see. But um, we surveyed our members in December and. 83% were not familiar. So we represent about 300,000 small independent businesses across the country. When you take, when you extrapolate that number across the economy and 32.6 million that will be affected, you're looking at tens of millions that could be in non-compliance just because they've never heard of these requirements. So I, I think this is a real eye-opening number when we present it to folks on on Capitol Hill and, and it, it catches their interest. And I think the interesting thing here is FinCEN recently responded to uh, a congressional letter and said, well, through January, we've had 296,000 small businesses report their, their ownership requirements. So we're doing really well. Well, that's, that's less than 1% of the expected uh, businesses that are supposed to report. So 
yeah, they're bragging about that, but it's not a a point that I think uh, does them any any favors. So they're we're in we're in trouble is uh, <laughs> kind of the message from from this survey that I would get. Hey, Josh. Yeah. What is the what is the timing tied to? I mean, I would think if there was going to be reporting that it may be tied into tax filing, but apparently it's not if you already have people that are, well, I mean, unless these folks are doing their taxes that early, but there's yeah. no, it's just, you have to report at some point in time throughout the year. And the deadline is December 31st each year. Yeah. They've extended it a little further into next year, but um, they want, they, they're saying businesses should report early and often, right? So as soon as possible is kind of their approach. But I've I've heard from a lot of uh, different trade associations and businesses that are like, we're waiting as long as we can um, to see what happens here because they just don't trust either the database, uh, the system that's in place, or, or they're kind of hopeful that Congress will come to their senses and either delay this or um, get rid of them. And I think that's probably a little too wishful thinking for for me personally. I'm I'm not sure that Congress will get their act together on on this issue, but um, I to be to be determined how how it plays out. But I think you're going to see a lot of businesses wait uh, wait until much later in the year to to see if this this sticks. But this has to be uh, <clears throat> reported annually, or once reported, you don't have to report again unless it an changes. It's annually. Annually, wow. Which, which is, it seems that's another area where where some members of Congress are saying, well, we should have just a box that you can check and say my information hasn't changed, something like that. Um, that should be common sense, but it's it's just not in government. So um, maybe that will be maybe that will be a change that Congress can rally behind. But to be to be determined again. Okay, we can go to the next slide. All right, here's here's the letter that I was just referencing um, the the FinCEN response. So. So there is some interest on Capitol Hill. We we we're working on this letter with Chairman McHenry from the Financial Services Committee in the House, Congressman Warren Davidson, Senators Rick Scott, and Senator Mike Rounds, and uh, got 80, 80 members of Congress to weigh in on it. And have grown our base a little bit further. This was in December, so I think we could hopefully get over one hundred, uh, maybe more than that now. Um, but I think we're we're just doing our best to raise awareness about this issue. This was just calling on FinCEN to delay these requirements for another year. They could do that already in statute, uh, but they don't want to delay. They want uh, this information uh, right now. So um, that's the that's the hurdle is that the the agency has no desire. The administration has no desire to uh, to hold off and raise awareness and make sure that businesses are, are able to comply. They just seem to be going full steam ahead on implementation. Okay. Next slide. So here's some, some of the, our thought on what could be done, repeal the corporate transparency act. Again, that's, that's what we would like, but it's not going to happen. Um, that would get rid of these requirements altogether. Uh, another thing you could defund through appropriations that 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 could that could be um, it's not going to be a complete defund, but you could potentially uh, pull back a little funding to FinCEN. And I think that's a much more realistic tactic. Uh, this is probably the third bullet is probably where things will will live um to put it bluntly it's where you could see and then as we discussed earlier congress addressed some of those vague definitions that allow fincen to broaden the scope of who is uh who has substantial control 
Um, maybe maybe you exempt sole propri proprietorships. Uh, maybe you address some of those some of those other more low hanging fruit issues that that but that could get bipartisan support. Um, but it's unfortunately the repeal is is not going to be fruitful in the current makeup of Congress. I think this is my last slide. You, we can move on to to just the regulatory state, which is a mess right now, or we can stay on uh, beneficial ownership, whatever whatever you all want to do. Are there any other questions for Josh on that? <clears throat> what can the chambers do to help? I mean, just get the word out to our businesses, basically, about this. Yeah, I, I think that's that would be good is is trying to raise awareness, but also, I mean, we would love to partner with any groups that uh that would support repeal. Um, we don't have legislation now, but we will eventually rally behind something in that area. So we're trying to find our champions on the hill now that that can really um move the needle on the issue. I think we've got a few, um, but it's for an issue like this, you want it to be bipartisan and and that's a, a very tricky, very tricky issue right now. So um, I think raising awareness, if you all hear from business owners and you want to funnel them to me, I would I think we're always looking for business examples of of um, folks that are saying, hey, you know. I, I had to comply with this. It took me 10 hours and, you know, it cost me $400. Like those, those type of examples are what members of Congress look at and they care about the added red tape and compliance burden. So anytime you can have a tangible number and show the effect of a policy, I think that's a good, that's a good place. And hopefully that, that can be that story can be told to members of Congress, um, whether they care, whether they listen, um, is another story. But the this, in my experience, the stories are what are what move the needle. Thanks, Josh. I have a quick question. Uh, this is Shifali. Josh, thank you for the great information. Uh, just a quick question about the. Uh, I know the Congress. Vincent, I mean, business owners are will be required to file annual beneficial ownership form. What will be the cost? Uh, did you mention that? I I must have missed it. Uh, the the whole cost, cost. Yeah, the whole cost is about seventy three billion. The compliance cost that's that's over. I believe a ten year window. <laughs> so it's pretty substantial compliance burden. Um, but I I imagine most of these. Most small businesses will just hire outside counsel to to try and help with this. And you know, as as we know, uh, small business owners don't have uh, ample resources to just go out and buy consultants and all those things. So um, we we know how how this goes. And when you have to spend on compliance, you're spending less on new business expansion and new new employees and uh, a new store. So. There are there are costs to to these regulatory burdens, and I think that's the story that we have to tell. I'm great, glad we're trying to address money laundering, but this is the cost. Um, this is what we had to give up in order to comply with these regulations. So hopefully that thing, I, it's it's going to be it's hard to know per business what the regular regulatory costs will be because I'm I'm everyone's going to navigate it differently, but it, that would be interesting if you start to ask some of your members, well, how much did you spend on legal fees to, to comply? Um, and then potentially we could extrapolate that across a larger sector or, and, or industries and get some, get some real data behind uh, some of these burdens. So the filing fee hasn't been determined yet, or are they going to charge? If any, well, that's going to be uh, up. I imagine that will be between the business owner and their their account, their accountant, or their their attorney, right? Um, you can just go on the website and file anytime.
but I would pro I would probably I'm not a lawyer. I would probably get legal counsel. So I'm so I'm in uh in legit compliance with this because it's new and I think FinCEN will be taking liberties where they can. Interesting. Thank you for sharing this with us. Yes. Sure. All right. You want to you want to be more depressed with the uh, <laughs> the regulatory <laughs> tsunami coming? <laughs> I'm sure you're already feeling it. I mean, it's been it's been an intense three years already. Um, but it's when you look at what's coming in the pipeline, it gets even more depressing. And so. This is this is uh, an area where I think Congress will be much more active in the coming months um, as they pursue trying to roll back some of these really burdensome regulations that agencies are finalizing. Uh, so we can go to the next slide. OK, so here we have a recent study. This was in December by the uh, by NAM, the National Association of Manufacturers. In 2022, the cost of to comply with regulations was over three trillion dollars. Um, that's huge. Uh, it's grown substantially uh, in recent years. I believe it's of over. I can't recall. It's over. I want to say 500 billion increase from 2012 when they last studied this. So it's growing. Uh, this is just layer upon layer upon layer of uh, regulations. And um, this is the compliance burden that that your members, that that your businesses, that our members are constantly uh, dealing with. It's 12, 000, over 12,000, almost 13,000 per employee. Um, NAM is interesting because they break it down by a small manufacturer versus a large manufacturer. And they show the cost for a for a small manufacturer to comply is about fifty thousand. Uh, for a large manufacturer, it's about thirty thousand. So you can really see how uh, regulate regulatory burdens impact different business sizes uh, through this study. And obviously, small businesses don't have uh, the resources that larger do. They don't have uh, rooms full of compliance officers to help navigate these really complex issues. So um, the burden falls definitely harder on on the small guys. And, and I think that the good thing is that seems to be a, a bipartisan understanding. It's just how do we address that disparity is where we get into the issues. So we can go to the next slide. All right. So here's here's where we are. Uh, so far with with the Biden administration, 450 billion final rule costs have been imposed already. Over 287 million paperwork hours have been added. So these are already final. Uh, these are already uh, implemented and affecting businesses and industries. Uh, the next bullet is where things get interesting. These are regulations that are in the pipeline. So these are under development um, and they will be uh, potentially finalized over the coming year. And that's where you're looking at a massive number, 616 billion in proposed rule costs and over 190 million paperwork hours. Just astronomical. We've never seen numbers like that add up the finalized and what's proposed and you're over a trillion dollars in a four year uh, four-year term, which we've never seen anything like that before. So these are these are really eye-popping numbers, and in a in a very bad way, um, because these these costs are going to fall on 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 the, the regulated entities out there, and and certainly on the small guys uh, disproportionately. So we can go to the next slide. Okay, here, here we have some of the top 10 costliest proposed rules. I, I actually, um, I wanted to add a slide before this one that 
that would say, okay, let's take out the 616 billion of proposed rule costs. And if we were to think of that as its own GDP, where would that rank in terms of a, a nation's size? And it would actually be the 23rd largest uh, GDP in the world. Um, so it would be right behind Argentina, which I think is 633 billion um, GDP in a year. So, I mean, how do you how do you take take these massive numbers and and put them in perspective? It's really hard, but um, they're huge. They're huge, and they they will be passed along to uh, our members, as we know. And here you can see these are. This is compiled by the American Action Forum, which I don't know if you guys follow their their work, but they're a, a think tank in Washington that Dan Goldbeck is is the the guy that tracks all these and he puts together incredible incredible data. He's every week he's updating kind of these are the most burdensome rules that are coming out, and this is something that he put together uh, in in January that shows where where we're looking at cost wise uh, for the 10, 10 costliest rules. And you can see a lot of these are in the EPA realm. If you're looking at emission standards for light and heavy, heavy uh, duty trucks, you're looking at uh, a phase three for the heavy duty trucks. That's a $39 billion cost. Um, you're looking at water heater, energy efficiency standards from DOE. That will be another big one. Um, but these are, these are to get it. It gives a little perspective on where where we anticipate a lot of the congressional activity. So I would I think EPA will be a a pretty busy one for CRAs, depending congressional review acts, depending on um, on how things go in the next next few months and how quickly rules are finalized. Any questions on that? Okay, we can go to the next slide. All right, I, I, I'll i quickly talk about um, opportunities that I think where, where we could have some room to run in the, the regulatory space. So, so one, one area that I'm optimistic on is the Regulatory Flexibility Act. That's a 1980 Jimmy Carter law, um, and that was... That was enacted because Congress and the president realized that regulations have a disproportionate impact on small businesses. Well, in the, you know, in the time since that became law, we know that agencies have found creative ways to, to navigate some of the requirements in that law. And I'll call them loopholes. They have found loopholes in the law that allow them to essentially certify that a rule will not have a significant economic impact. An example of that is WOTUS, the Waters of the United States rule that affects farmers, it affects landowners, ranchers, developers. Um, the EPA and the Army Corps of Engineers certified the rule will not have a significant, significant economic impact. I I would argue that it does, right? It, according to one estimate, I saw Iowa, 97% of, of land in Iowa will be fall under this new uh, definition of WOTUS. How, how in the world are all those small farms and large farms not impacted? Um, so th the fact that they can just certify is an area where I think Congress could strengthen the RFA. Um, there's other areas where they could either increase uh, some of the requirements for agencies to look at retrospective review, which they're already required to do, but they often don't. That would be kind of looking at the regulatory accumulation over the years and saying, all right, we can, we should, this is duplicative. Uh, we don't, we no longer need this regulation. We need to kind of clean out our closet a little bit. Um, so there's, there's a few different things we can talk about there that um, are, that have had bipartisan support that could be an area for, for folks to look at on the Hill, but um, regulatory issues, as you know, are such a, it's almost like you bring it up and everyone just goes back to their camp because they don't, it's, it's such a hard, it's such a complex, such a difficult issue. And there's so many loud 
voices in opposition of any type of reform that it's a very challenging issue to have a conversation on. But um, it's as we see from from some of the numbers that are coming out of Washington these days, it needs to happen. We need to have this conversation. We need to talk about ways that we can eliminate red tape and streamline processes and, and reduce compliance costs for, for the small businesses. So that's uh we can end it there. We can go wherever, wherever you guys want it. Any, any type of questions that y'all have, I'll, I'll try my best to answer them. Josh, I have a, a, kind of just a general overall question. Obviously you would mention that, you know, throughout the presentation that you, you guys are up on Capitol Hill talking to the congressional delegation. Um, you know, I think in general, we know our, our delegation is relatively liberal, but um, do you ever have a chance to talk with them? Do you know what their position is? Do you have any feedback? Because obviously I think what we can do is we can gather some data, like you had said, about how it's impacting our local businesses, but more so what can we do from an outreach standpoint, whether it's, you know, whether it's, it's Jake or one of the senators, you know, again, I think we probably know where they stand on, on some of these issues, but by the same token, have you have your has your group talked to them at all and, and can you give us any feedback and any recommendations on whether we send them letters phone calls emails whatnot yeah i i wouldn't i wouldn't do phone calls or letters i think if you can develop a relationship with uh legislative staff you know whether you go in for a flying and you meet with that person and you you're checking in every few months just saying hey this is coming from this agency or this is coming down the pike that's probably the best way that I would approach staff is to build that relationship. Not the worst thing about being a staffer is when an interest group would come to you on in the 11th hour and be like, Hey, I need this done. Right. So as if it's someone that you've built that relationship with um, just like in business, right. It's, it's someone that, you know, someone that you've, you've formed a little bit of a bond with and, and it's a, you're a trusted advisor. I think that's, if you can get to that place, that's really awesome. And it, it helps, uh, helps everyone to kind of raise these issues with and get them elevated to the member. I think with phone calls, it's great. You might, you might, uh, it might matter more to certain offices, but form letters, phone calls, it, it's just, in my experience, it wasn't as effective as where you can, you have that conduit directly to the legislative staffer. So I think if whether however you build that, whether it's just uh, you go on, you know, online and find that staffer, uh, or you call up and say, "Hey, I want to talk to your environmental staffer or your healthcare staffer," um, and then you you start to work that relationship a little bit. So I think that's the the approach that I would take. I I, I know where your delegation is on a lot of these issues and it, it's going to be hard to find a friendly voice um especially on regulatory issues and the environmental interests are so powerful um that any type of even a even a very what i would consider a low-hanging fruit regulatory reform bill really has no shot these days um, that 1980 jimmy carter law there's zero chance it would be passed into law today so the pendulum has shifted so far. I wish I had a secret sauce that that uh, would really speak to how to to make make headway into some of these offices, but I I just don't. Um, what I find is just to go in, and I'm I'm essentially doing the same thing you guys are. I'm I'm cold emailing. I'm going in saying, hey, can we just take a few minutes to to discuss some of these small business issues? Some of them. I'm sending five, six emails. I can't get a response. Some of them are like, yeah, just send me the issues in an email. Uh, some will take time and sit down and, and talk. Unfortunately, it's, that's probably a smaller number than that, that will actually meet that I would, that I would hope for. But um, I think if you guys can build those relationships that, that will, that will do a lot for, for your advocacy efforts. Interesting. Any other questions for Josh? Do you follow up? Do you obviously there's a bunch of issues going on? Do you do you target one issue at a certain particular point in time? So as you know, as we move forward and we build this relationship, if we have the relationship that we can 
you, you'd say, listen, this is the one that's that we're working on real hard right now. This is this is coming to the forefront that they're going to be working on it. This, you know, you guys need to get involved and really reach out at this point. Do you provide that type of information so we know when we really got to put the pressure on? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we're we'll we have strategies depending on what's live at that moment. If uh you know, if we anticipate Main Street Tech Certainty Act coming up for a vote, we're going to mobilize our members through the grassroots. We're going to really get get our message out to congressional staff. We're going to try to meet with appropriate committees of jurisdiction. Uh, I think that's that's probably and, and that's when you have that relationship is you can go to that staffer and say, hey, this is coming up for a vote. Just keep an eye out for it or. Even even what I find is when they have time, uh, that's that's even a better time to reach out is when their issues are not hot at the moment. They'll have a few minutes, a few more minutes to sit down and chat and talk about um, about things that are, you know, a little little broader issue content. So um, I don't I don't think it hurts to even when when say like healthcare is the focus and you want to talk about a, a tax issue or something like that, reach out to that tax staffer and say, hey, would love to I'm gonna be in DC, would love to grab coffee with you or something like that. Um that type of thing. You know, you can you can find find time um when when issues aren't aren't politically sexy. Josh, your uh, NFIB Thanks. has a great website in helping. Um, you, a couple of times we've been notified to go to your website and, and talk to your congressman or your your um, senator, and it's been very helpful way to find you know communication to them about certain issues. So we've done that a couple of times through our chamber. Awesome. Yeah, and I think I think to the extent that you can encourage your members not to submit a form letter to make it a personalized story if they are emailing or they are uh, sharing their story, make sure that they're speaking from their own experience and not just saying, I, you know, I checked this box. This is my, my message collectively. Um, they want to hear unique, unique stories. So I would just, to the extent that you can encourage your members to, to be different, and uh and and to share their own personal experience that would be that would be my my word of encouragement well thank you for all the work you do up there and um really feel grateful that you were able to spend some time with us and give us this information thank you josh no problem anytime anytime thank you for this information Thank nope. you. Thank you. Very informative, but very depressing at the same time. <laughs> I know. I'm sorry. That's that's one thing that I I can guarantee is my issues are just going to be oh we're in trouble. So hey, we'll we'll keep doing our best. That's all we can do. Yeah.